enter to the world of biochemistry. So today I will give you a short lecture on the process of glycolysis. We all know that glycolysis is very important uh, because it is the first step of cellular respiration. Actually, the part of glycolysis uh, is the anaerobic, anaerobic process because it occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell in the absence of oxygen. But the product of glycolysis, that is pyruvic acid, it enters the mitochondria and then the process of aerobic respiration or the rest part of cellular respiration starts. Uh, the fate of pyruvic acid, however, depends upon various things like the energy content of the uh, cell at that time and the demand of the cell at that at, uh, demand of the cell at that time. So the glycolysis is the first step of aerobic respiration. We can also say that glycolysis is the first step of aerobic respiration. Uh, if oxygen is available, then the pyruvic acid will enter the uh, TCA cycle and from the TCA cycle, it will enter the EP chain and we, we will eventually get our ATP that is much needed for the uh, for fueling various processes of our body. So uh, glycolysis is actually a biochemical pathway and it includes 10 reactions and um, we will explain the mechanism of each reaction we will explain the factors which are affecting each of the steps and how these steps are controlled, when and where the rate limiting steps are uh, situated and how each uh, of these steps are being allosterically modified. What are the different hormonal effects on glycolysis? We will also discuss on that aspect of glycolysis. Okay, so let me present my uh, note. Okay, so glycolysis. What's written that glycolysis is a term used to describe the metabolic pathway involving the degradation of glucose into pyruvic acid or pyruvate and energy. Actually, from glycolysis, we are uh, getting only two molecules of ATP that I will show you in eventually in my entire note. In the form of ATP, we are getting directly two molecules of ATP. But we are getting reduced nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, that is NADH. And this NADH will act as another source of ATP or further sources of ATP when this NADH will enter the ET chain, which is located within the mitochondria. So if glycolysis is only, uh, only restricted to the anaerobic part, we will only get two molecules of ATP. But if it, uh, if it proceeds to the aerobic part of the respiration, we will get further six molecules of ATP from it that I will show eventually. So, okay. So glucose is very important and common fuel. In mammal, glucose is the only fuel that the brain uses under non-starvation conditions, okay? And the only fuel that RBC can use at all. It's actually uh, the cells where mitochondria is absent. The glycolysis becomes the only source of production of ATP and for those cells like RBC, glycolysis is very, very important, okay? And glucose is our uh, main source of fuel, though we can use fructose and galactose also, but the percentage of usage of glucose is the maximum and brain cells can only use glucose. They cannot use the fructose or galactose as the source of energy. So this is the most vital importance of glycolysis that without glycolysis, probably all of us, uh, probably no, definitely all our cells will die because uh, without glycolysis, we can't even generate the minimum amount of ATP that is needed for the cells to go on with their life processes. Okay. So is glycolysis a metabolic pathway? The answer is yes, of course, glycolysis is a metabolic pathway, okay? So actually metabolic pathway can be divided uh, according to, uh, divided many parts according to the mechanism. According to the, if we can say that uh, a step is occurring after another step, means there's a sequence of steps, then we can say that it is a linear metabolic pathway. Uh, for example, glycolysis is a linear metabolic pathway where one step is leading to the leading to another means the substrate of the first reaction is acting as a product of the other. Then the product is again acted the, acting as the substrate of the second reaction. And this way it is a stepwise reaction and every step is being catalyzed by a particular enzyme.
they had uh, there are certain other metabolic pathways like cyclic acid cycle or Krebs cycle, which is actually a cyclic pathway where we will get the uh, initial product and the end products are the same. So it will be known as a cyclic uh, metabolic pathway. Then there, there can be some spiral metabolic pathways also like the biosynthesis of that is uh, biosynthesis of fatty acids we will uh, discuss on maybe later on. So what are the different characteristics of metabolic pathway? First of all, that metabolic pathways are irreversible. Means we, you can get only one way. There may be certain steps, certain steps which are reversible, but as a whole, the entire process is irreversible. Okay. So every metabolic pathway has a committed first step. What is now there's a difference between a committed step and a rate limiting step. Committed step means when I have uh, passed that step, then I will have to complete the entire pathway. And what is the rate limiting step? The slowest step of the reaction pathway is known as the rate limiting step. Okay, so the first step is generally the committed step of the metabolic pathway. All metabolic pathways are regulated as I will eventually show you that what are the regulation points of glycolysis pathway. Metabolic pathways in eukaryotic cells occur in specific cellular locations. For example, the glycolysis occurs in cytoplasm of the cell. But if we uh, if we discuss about citric acid cycle, then that will occur in the mitochondria of the cell. Okay, then um, we can also uh, classify the metabolic pathways as catabolic pathways and anabolic pathways. Glycolysis is, of course, an example of catabolic pathway where we are breaking down a particular product. That is, we are breaking down glucose and we are getting pyruvic acid. PCA cycle, lipolysis, all these are examples of catabolic pathways. And what are some examples of anabolic pathways where we are synthesizing certain things, say fatty acid biosynthesis or gluconeogenesis, that is production of glucose from sources other than carbohydrates, say from proteins, then those pathways become the anabolic pathways. Now, what are the main functions of metabolic pathways? Of course, as uh, we were at first step uh, or in the initial point, I was saying that the main function of glycolysis is the production of ATP. So the main function of metabolic pathways, of course, is to generate energy to fill the, fill the vital functions of our body. And of course, uh, the synthesis of certain biological molecules, as we are seeing that in case of uh, gluconeogenesis, we are synthesizing glucose or fatty acid uh, biogenesis, we are synthesizing certain fatty acids or certain lipids. Okay. So let's come to the history part. Uh, the glycolysis pathway was elucidated, that is deciphered in 1940 by M. Dave, Meyerhoff and Parnas. Actually, there were many other assistants, as you can see here, but uh, three persons, that is M. Dave, Meyerhoff and Parnas were the key persons in behind this discovery. So the pathway, um, with, uh, to respect them, the pathway is also alter alternately named as EMP pathway, that is M. Dave, Meyerhoff, Parnas pathway, that is EMP pathway. Then uh, we can say that glycolysis is the central pathway for glucose catabolism. Okay, it is a sequence of ten-stepped reaction. All the steps are catalyzed by enzymes, which results in production of pyruvate and also simultaneous production of ATP. Okay, now in this oxidative process, one molecule of glucose is partially partially oxidized to two molecules of pyruvate. See, I am using the word partially oxidized. Because one molecule of glucose can potentially provide us with eight molecules of ATP. But glycolysis is only part of the process. So uh, during glycolysis, we are only getting uh, two molecules of ATP and we are getting two molecules of pyruvate. These two molecules of pyruvate will again enter other metabolic processes to give the full yield of glucose. Okay. Now the major pathway of glucose metabolism occurs in the cytosol of the cell. This unique pathway occurs aerobically as well as anaerobically. That is, uh, anaerobically means that it uh, doesn't involve the molecular oxygen. That is first part, that is glycolysis. And aerobically, if oxygen is available, then the product of glycolysis, that is pyruvate, will enter the aerobic part of the cellular respiration cycle. Okay? In aerobic organisms, glycolysis is the prelude to citric acid cycle and ETC. ETC means electron transport chain. 
so prelude means that comes before so glycolysis will occur first then there will be citric acid cycle and then there will be etc or electron transport chain okay now uh, this is just a glimpse of the entire process then i will explain step by step so glycolysis process will be divided into two phases preparatory phase first five steps will be included under preparatory phase or energy investment phase and the last five phases will come under energy yielding phase or pay off phase okay so the in the first five step what we will see that glucose will be eventually degraded into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxy acetone phosphate now why i am using the term degraded this is because glucose is a six carbon compound but glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxy acetone phosphates are three carbon compounds so eventually the six carbon glucose will be uh, degraded or cleaved or branched into two parts that is three carbon containing products glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxy acetone phosphates which are nicknamed as gap and gap okay now this cleavage requires the investment two atp molecules as you can see that in the first step we are uh, using one atp molecule and in the third step we are utilizing another atp molecule so two molecules of atp are being invested in the process therefore it is known as the energy investment phase okay okay now uh, i will explain the steps in details later on now let us go to the next part of uh, the thing that is pay off phase the last five phases will uh, will we'll form the pay off phase or the energy extraction phase what will happen here we found glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate here and dihydroxy acetone phosphate now these things will actually isomerize that is the rest of the reaction will occur from glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate as you can see that the arrowhead is being marked from glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate so glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate will eventually be converted into pyruvic acid or pyruvate and then what will occur then this dihydroxy acetone phosphate will change to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and this process will again occur this that is this process will be repeated so this entire step will be repeated actually twice that's why here in brackets 2 2 2, two are given which shows that this process will occur twice in a cell that is from oxidation of one glucose molecule we are getting the preparatory phase once but we are getting the payoff phase twice okay so this is the payoff phase where we are getting actually four molecules of atp during one step we are getting uh, uh, two molecules of atp and since the whole thing entires actually uh, twice then we are getting four molecules of atp and in the preparatory phase we uh, invested two molecules of atp and in the payoff phase we are getting four molecules of atp so four minus two our net gain of atp is two atp molecules and the most important thing is that uh, additionally you are getting two molecules of nadh in step six this is very important as i will eventually show you also because this nadh will again as as so act as source of atp when this nadh will donate their electrons to the et chain actually each molecule of nadh when they um, donate their electrons we get three molecules of atp from it so uh, from two molecules of nadh we will get additionally six molecules of atp Though uh, nowadays in the modern calculation, it is said uh, it is said that the uh, actual calculation should not be three molecules of ATP. It should be two point five molecules of ATP. So uh, if we go by the modern calculation, then we are getting another extra five molecules of ATP from the NADH molecules that are also generated during glycolysis. So from glycolysis. In one word, we are getting two molecules of ATP and we are getting two molecules of NADH. These uh, two molecules of NADH, according to classical calculation, will give us another six molecules of ATP later on when it is entering the EP chain. Okay. Now, let me come to the detailed analysis of each step. The first uh, step is known as phosphorylation. It is the first step of the preparatory phase also 
what is happening glucose is being phosphorylated by atp to form a sugar phosphate that is glucose 6 phosphate as you can see this is a structure of the glucose and uh, we always mark the primes of the uh, prime of the glucose molecule that is the carbons by prime number so this is the carbon 1 prime number 2 prime number 3 prime 4 prime 5 prime 6 prime and what is happening from atp we are taking one phosphate and we are transferring this phosphate to the sixth uh, sixth carbon that is six prime position the carbon is there we are transferring the phosphate from atp to here so we are getting glucose six phosphate okay so this glucose six phosphate is actually a sugar phosphate and you know this is a very important state because you know, we have got certain glucose transporters in every cell which are helping to transport the glucose from the cytoplasm to the cell. But these transporters act both wise. So if the glucose is entering the cell, it may also exit the cell also. But you have to phosphorylate the glucose. Then the shape of the glucose will change. And once the glucose enters and it gets phosphorylated, it cannot go back to the cytoplasm. So this uh, first step is the committed step. That is, once the glucose gets changed to glucose 6-phosphate, this glucose 6-phosphate can't go back to the cytoplasm. You can see that this is the structure of the glucose. This is the glucose 6-phosphate where a phosphate being attached to the sixth carbon okay and this is the committed state remember why because once the glucose is being converted to glucose 6 phosphate this glucose 6 phosphate cannot go back to the cytoplasm because its structure is being changed and it cannot get back through the glucose transporter okay and this reaction is being um, catalyzed by hexokinase enzyme now there is an interesting thing actually there are Two enzymes, glucokinase and hexokinase. Most of our cell makes use of hexokinase. But in case of liver and pancreas, we are getting glucokinase. Now, you know, pancreas is very important from the point of view of glucose metabolism because pancreas secretes insulin. Okay, so this glucokinase acts as the glucose sensor for pancreas. Means when the amount of glucose gets increased in pancreas, automatically the glucokinase glucose this glucose sensor here is glucokinase okay not hexokinase so glucokinase will automatically sense the uh, increased amount of glucose and insulin will be kicked uh, kick on we can say that insulin will be stimulated and this glucose will be converted to glycogen and stored in the liver so hexokinase uh, sorry the glucokinase is acting as a glucose sensor in case of pancreas and but uh, the difference is that actually hexokinase is a more active enzyme because uh, for glucose it has got a higher binding affinity as compared to the glucokinose is the uh, the binding affinity or the km value of uh, hexokinase the km value is much lower km value lower means binding affinity higher so the um, affinity binding affinity for glucose of hexokinase is much higher as compared to glucokinase but in case of liver and pancreas only glucokinase is available so their glucokinase is the uh, acting is responsible for this first step that is phosphorylation step of glycolysis okay so let, let me go to the second step uh, the second step is isomerization step now what are isomers Isomers are actually structural uh, structural differences between the molecule. The formulas are uh, generally the same, but the structural orientation of the molecules gets changed, as you can know from your um, chemistry knowledge. Okay, so here what happens? The glucose six phosphate, which was formed in the earlier step, is just getting isomerized to fructose six phosphate. Okay. what is happening the carbonyl oxygen that is c double bond o, uh, c double bond o oxygen which was present in uh, carbon 1 on carbon 1 in case of glucose 6 phosphate is just getting shifted to carbon 2 and as a result the aldose form is being changed to the ketosome this is this is the aldose form that is six membered ring form and this is getting changed to the five membered ring form that is ketose form what is happening the 
Uh, see here, the carbonyl oxygen was attached to carbon 1. But here, the carbonyl oxygen is being attached to the carbon 2. So this is just an isomerization reaction where glucose 6-phosphate is getting changed to its isomer, that is fructose 6-phosphate. And therefore, the enzyme involved is known as phosphohexoisomerase. Okay, since both of these are hexo sugars and the phosphate group, uh, and it also involves the phosphate group, so these are known as phosphohexose. That is, glucose 6-phosphate is also a phosphohexose, fructose 6-phosphate is also a phosphohexose. And only one isomer is being transformed into another. So the enzyme's name is phosphohexoisomerase. This is the second step. Then comes the third step, that is phosphorylation. Now, what is being phosphorylated? This fructose 6-phosphate. Another phosphate molecule is being attached to the fructose 6-phosphate. And so the product is fructose 1,6-biphosphate. That is, at first, we were having uh, the phosphate group only in 6 position now we are also getting one phosphate group in the one position so we are getting fructose 1 6 biphosphate um, this is uh, this is an irreversible reaction as you can see from the sign also this is an irreversible reaction and it is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphofructokinase okay now you know uh, when uh, we will study about the enzyme chemistry we will see that kinases are those enzymes which are involved uh, in the phosphorylation process uh, generally involving atp so here what is happening uh, one extra phosphate we are getting that is being attached to the one position of the fructose that extra phosphate is actually coming from the atp so this is the first of the energy investment process where we are investing one ATP. We are taking out the phosphate group from it and we are transferring it to the one position of the fructose molecule and getting fructose 1, 6, 5 phosphate. Now this step is also very important because this is the rate limiting step of entire glycolysis process. That means the much amount of, the more the amount of phosphate fructokinase available to us or available to the cell, the faster will be the process of glycolysis. Okay. So this is the rate limiting enzyme of this entire process and this is the rate limiting step also. Now I will discuss about these uh, control points again later on but let us just remember that uh, this enzyme that is phosphofructokinase will be allosterically activated by AMP and inhibited by ATP. That means if the cell already has high amount of ATP, then this process will occur very slowly because then we won't need much amount of ATP again immediately. So this process will slow down the entire process of glycolysis. Okay, But if at present we are in need of ATP, that means in our uh, cell, the amount of AMP is high, but the amount of ATP is very low then this AMP will act as an activator of phosphofructokinase or PFK1 enzyme and this uh, this step will be uh, this uh, step will be uh, this step will be speeded up and if this step's velocity increases then the entire velocity of the glycolysis process increases okay and there is another regulator also that is citrate uh, remember or keep in mind one thing uh, citrate is an citrate is an indicator of energy means higher citrate means your cell has got enough energy for the present okay so if you have got enough energy for present you don't need more energy to glycolysis so citrate will act as a negative regulator or negative inhibitor of pfk1 enzyme okay so we can say that phosphofructokinase enzyme acts as molecular indicator of the energy status of cell that means they will uh, they will deduce whether you have got enough ATP in the cell at present and thereby they will either inhibit or they will stimulate the process of glycolysis. So this step three becomes very important. Then step four, what happens in step four? This fructose 1,6-biphosphate is being broken down to two three carbon compounds that is dihydroxyacetone phosphate and disaldehyde 3 phosphate 
Group of 1,6 biphosphate is being broken down to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. The enzyme responsible is known as a aldolase. Okay. So here again another thing is happening and aldose is uh, means uh, this fructose 6 biphosphate, fructose 1, 6 biphosphate is being broken down into one aldose form of 3 carbon uh, carbohydrate and another ketose form of 3 carbon carbohydrate. The rest of the stems that will uh, that we will uh, encounter in glycolysis will always occur from this glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Okay, rest of the step will occur from this glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Now this step involves unique cleavage of the C C bond between C three and C four. Actually, the breakage is happening from here between C three and C four, and we are getting one aldose form of carbohydrate. You can see this is an aldose form and another ketose form you can see this is a ketose form another ketose form of the carbohydrate that is gap and gap as we can nickname them okay next comes step five step five is the last step of the preparatory phase this is known as isomerization again another isomerization reaction will occur what is this this is the actually the step five or here I have given it separately. That is the isomerization between glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. As I have previously told you, that glucose 6 phosphate was an isomer of fructose 6 phosphate. Similarly, here also gap and gap are isomers of each other. So at present, the rest of the step will occur, uh, will uh, always happen from the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So here what will happen, dihydroxyacetone phosphate will be converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and uh, rest of the process will again reoccur from dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So the enzyme responsible here is known as triose phosphate isomerase. Why triose? Because both of these substrates that is dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates are three carbon compounds. So these are actually trioses and these are also phosphates because uh, phosphates because a phosphate group is always included. So they are named as triose phosphate. And why isomerase? Because both of them are isomers of each other. So the reaction is simply, tran uh, simply transforming one isomer to another. Now with that we come to the P of phase. Till now we have only invested the energy. Now it's time to get it back. Okay. So step six is known as phosphorylation coupled to oxidation. What will happen here? Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will get converted to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerin. Okay. Now, what is happening? Two simultaneous reactions are occurring here. One is oxidation reduction reaction and the second is a phosphorylation reaction or we can also say it to be a condensation reaction. Now, all this we are getting molecules of gap because first we are getting one molecule of gap and then that gap that is dihydroxyacetone phosphate is converted to gap and we are repeating the same process. So these two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates are oxidized here. Okay. So what will be reduced if someone is being or something is being oxidized then concomitantly another thing has to get reduced. So here we can see that NAD is getting reduced to NAD. Again, this becomes a very important step because this is the only step of glycolysis where you are getting NADH. So it is very important step because it is NADH, which later on, as I have told you, will again help us to get the ATP. So in this step, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is being converted to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. That means we are adding another molecule of phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now this molecule of uh, the phosphate we are not getting from the ATP mind it we are getting it from an inorganic phosphate okay we are getting this from an inorganic phosphate we are condensing it with glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and we are getting one three this phosphoglycerate okay now in this particular case the redox reaction is exergonic okay with that, we come to step 7 of glycolysis, that is the second step of the payoff phase, which is a phosphorylation step. Now, what we obtained in the previous step, we obtained 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Now, this 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is being converted to 3-phosphoglycerate here, okay? Now, this is a very important step. Why? 
because this is the first step in the glycolysis process we are getting back the atp the atp we invested during the preparatory phase we are now getting back those atp now since this entire thing happens twice so this molecule uh, 200 bracket is written here therefore we are getting two atp molecules in this step that is from 13 bisphosphoglycerate we are getting three phosphoglycerate now this is another important thing because this is the first step which is a substrate level phosphorylation that is from the substrate you are directly getting the atp otherwise you know how we get the atp we uh, we get nadh actually this nadh gets transferred to the krebs cycle from krebs cycle it goes to the et chain and only then we can get the atp so that is known as oxidative phosphorylation but this is known as actually the substrate level phosphorylation that is from 13 bisphosphoglycerate we are getting the 3 phosphoglycerate okay so uh, the substrate level uh, substrate level phosphorylation or step 7 is a very important step of glycolysis okay now the step 8 comes to isomerization now what we got in the previous step the three phosphoglycerate it is simply getting converted to phosphoglycerate this is probably the simplest step of glycolysis you can see here that the phosphate group is being transferred from the third carbon atom to the second carbon atom so simply the phosphate group is being transferred from three to second position of the carbon so this is a phosphoryl shift reaction or this is a isomerization reaction where three phosphoglycerate is being converted to two phosphoglycerate okay next comes the step 9 this is dehydration reaction this is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphoenol uh, sorry this is catalyzed by the enzyme enolase okay now this is another very important thing why we have to do this thing that is why we have to convert phosphoglycerate to phosphoenol pyruvate this also has got phosphate this also has got phosphate but what uh, the difference is that in case of phosphoenol the transfer potential of the phosphate group is much higher now what is transfer potential actually we want to transfer this phosphate group to atp and get another molecule of atp now the process of this transfer of phosphate group from phosphoenol pyruvate will be easier as compared to the transfer from two phosphoglycerate why is it so you know uh, this is known as enol phosphate now let me say what is enol phosphate enol phosphate is formed when phosphate group attaches to a hydroxyl group which is bound to a carbon atom having double bond this phosphate group is attached to a hydroxyl group which is bound to a carbon atom having a double bond now this enol phosphate has got a higher phosphoryl transfer potential as compared to this ester phosphate you see the transfer potential or the del g of hydrolysis of a phosphate ester is only minus 3 kilocalorie per, per mole however the del g of hydrolysis of a phosphate enol or enol phosphate or phosphoenol pyruvate is minus 14.8 kilocalorie per mole we know the more negative the del g value is the more spontaneous the reaction is therefore the transfer of phosphate group from phosphoenol pyruvate will be much faster as compared to from phosphoglycerate so this is the main aim of this reaction that is to make the phosphate group more transferable okay and this is simultaneously another dehydration reaction also because while two phosphoglycerate is being converted to phosphoenol pyruvate one molecule of water molecule is being removed from the molecule okay now the last step of glycolysis is phosphoryl transfer now what is happening here as i told you that the main aim of creation of this phosphoenol pyruvate was to transfer this phosphate group okay now this phosphate group this phosphate group is being transferred to adp the phosphate group is transferred to adp and we are getting another two molecules of atp so i can uh, i will remind you or i will revise you again that is in step 7 we got two molecules of atp and again in step 10 we are getting two molecules of atp so totally during payoff phase we are getting four molecules of atp 
and this is another important thing is there that this is the second step of the substrate level phosphorylation or second substrate level phosphorylation occurring during glycolysis where we are getting an atp directly from the substrate now with this we come to the end of the process of glycolysis let me sum up the entire process now this is the balance sheet of say our glycolysis this is the preparatory phase and this is the payoff phase as you can see that these are the inputs that we have given to glycolysis and these are the outputs that we got now if we, if we cancel out the common terms this is the mean result of glycolysis that is glucose is uh, converted to two molecules of pyruvate here two molecules of nad plus is being reduced to two molecules of nadh two molecules of adp and inorganic phosphate are giving us two molecules of atp and water is being produced as a byproduct in the last reaction we saw that it was a dehydration reaction also uh, not in the last reaction in the second last reaction that is the step 9 form it was uh, last form okay so uh, okay maybe i mix uh, step 9 and then step 10 step 10 i told you that from phosphorylated pyruvate we are getting the pyruvate and we are also getting two molecules of atp okay so this is the overall balance sheet of glycolysis okay so glycolysis has a net yield of two very important thing net yield two molecules of atp and two molecules of nadh we are getting two molecules of atp directly and if this two molecules of nadh gets uh, entry into the mitochondria then we will get according to classical theory we will get another six molecules of atp from it therefore total yield will be 6 plus 2 that is eight molecules of atp okay so let us sum up the entire process so from glycolysis we are getting glucose is oxidized to pyruvate NAD plus is reduced to NADH and ADP is being phosphorylated to ATP. Now, uh, let me get to another fact of glycolysis. So, so the main uh, byproduct of glycolysis was pyruvate. Now, what will happen to this pyruvate? As you can see in this figure, this pyruvate mostly in case of aerobic respiration, it will get converted into acetyl coenzyme A. this will enter to krebs cycle from that to et chain and we will get atp from it but you know in some cases in human beings also this pyruvate is being converted to lactate in absence of oxygen you know if we uh, sit in the same position for hours on then sometimes we get a muscle cramp or muscle pain this is due to the accumulation of this lactic acid in those muscles that is the pyruvate the uh, glucose is being metabolized pyruvate is being produced but the pyruvate instead of yielding atp it is being converted into lactic this lactic is accumulating in your muscles and you are feeling the pain and in case of certain bacteria you will get that this pyruvate will get converted into acetaldehyde and from that they will uh, give the production of ethanol okay so this is known as alcoholic fermentation process now these two processes are very important because these two processes will give us or regenerate nad plus you know in the entire process of um, glycolysis we saw that nad was input and uh, it was being converted to nad then we we have to regain those nad plus now these are the process where we are regaining the nad plus and this will again act as the fuel source in case of glycolysis so from pyruvate when we are converting pyruvate to lactate we are regaining our nad plus when we are uh, converting pyruvate to ethanol we are also regaining our nad plus so regeneration of nad plus is the main purpose of these reactions okay now these are some extra informations we i uh, which i wanted to give you uh, first of thing is that is glucose the only source of energy for our cell the answer is no besides glucose galactose and fructose can also enter the process of glycolysis you see galactose converted to glucose 6 phosphate and enters the glycolytic pathway fructose converted to fructose 6 phosphates and enter the glycolytic pathway so these things can also give us energy but the cell preferentially always uses glucose and there are certain cells as i have told you brain cells which can only use glucose as their source of energy the second thing i wanted to discuss with you is that what is the fate of glucose is the fate of glucose to always turn up to pyruvic acid the answer is again no 
the glucose mainly get converted to glucose 6 phosphate and from there it enters the pyruvic acid and aerobic respiration pathway but it may also get converted to 6 phosphogluconolactone this is actually the pentose phosphate pathway or hexose monophosphate shunt pathway now this ppp pentose phosphate pathway is very important another important metabolic pathway of our body that gives us ribose 5 phosphate which goes to the synthesis of nucleotides in our body and another in another scenario this glucose 6 phosphate gets converted to glucose 1 phosphate that is isomerization again and from there we can convert it into glycogen which happens in our liver cells okay so these three are the phases of the glucose either it is going to the pyruvic acid pathway through glycolysis or to the pentose phosphate pathway or through the glycogen synthesis path okay now what is the significance of this glycolysis process the first and foremost significance is that glycolysis is a universal pathway that is present in all the cells be it prokaryotic be it eukaryotic every cell has got glycolytic pathway and ancient prokaryotes which existed uh, much way before us and uh, even before oxygen uh, was present in the environment they also used this glycolysis process to make their atp next it is a universal central pathway of glucose catabolism that is occurring in every tissue of our body and helping us to generate minimum amount of atp next it is very important for generation of energy in cells without mitochondria example rbc rbc have no mitochondria therefore they cannot go for aerobic respiration so the only source of atp generation for rbc is glycolysis next the intermediates of the glycolytic pathway say glucose 6 phosphate say fructose 6 phosphate these again can enter other metabolic pathways and can be utilized for production of other things say glucose 6 phosphate can enter pentose phosphate pathway or the glycogen metabolism pathway and uh, and give rise to other by products there fructose 6 phosphate can enter the pentose phosphate pathway glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate can enter the pelvic cycle or again ppp that is pentose phosphate pathway so we can say that the intermediate of the glycolysis will lead to the formation of amino sugars triglyceride synthesis production of lactate and all other metabolites of the body okay now with that let me come to certain diseases which are associated with glycolysis the first and foremost is hemolytic anemia you know as i have already told you that since rbc has got no mitochondria so glycolysis is the only source of energy available to them so any defect in the glycolytic pathway will lead to hemolytic anemia in which this rbc will break down they will be disintegrated okay and we will uh, we will suffer from anemia another thing is that in case of malignant tumor cells the rate of glycolysis is increased very much okay increased to various uh, steps okay in malignant tumor cells the rate of glycolysis increases this fact was first discovered by warburg in 1930 and this is named as warburg effect so this is very important this may come as uh, a question in your competitive exams that is what is warburg effect it is the preference for highly proliferative active cells for example cancer cells to shift to an this will be sorry this will be anaerobic glycolysis to shift to anaerobic glycolysis even in the presence of adequate oxygen okay say so oxygen is available then also these cells will go for glycolysis for the production of their atp okay another trivia that i wanted to give you that there is another similar pathway Uh, to glycolysis which is found in certain bacteria mind it this is found only in certain bacteria not in eukaryotic cell which is known as entner deuterov pathway okay here actually the enzyme for glycolysis that is phosphofructokinase 1 that is defective therefore this bacteria opt for another pathway known as entner deuterov pathway to metabolize their glucose they are they get one molecule of atp for every molecule of glucose one molecule of nadh and one molecule of nadph okay with this let me go to the regulation pathway of glycolysis 
you know glycolysis will depend upon the amount of glucose available to the cell and amount of glucose will depend upon the efficiency of glucose uptake to the cell and another thing will be the breakdown rate of the glycogen now how is the glucose uptake by the cell there are certain transporters present in our plasma membrane known as glucose transporters or glut this glut helps to pick up the glucose from the cytoplasm and enter, uh, enter them to the cell there are various isoforms of glut uh, glut that is glucose transferase i'm not going to the details it is written here uh, like glut 1 is found in rbc Uh, in blood placenta barrier glut 2 is found in pancreas in liver glut 3 is found in neuron these isoforms various isoforms are found in various cells but the main purpose is same that is to transfer the glucose from the cytoplasm to the cell so the amount of glut increases the amount of glycolysis will also increase so the if the number of glut receptors are much higher in the cell plasma membrane then in those cells the rate of glycolysis will increase as simple as that okay and the second is that the rate of breakdown of glycogen the cells can store the extra glucose in the form of glycogen when glucose levels are high in the cell we all know this thing so this glycogen can be converted back to glucose via glycogenolysis and if glucose is available to me then that i can uh, i can channelize that glucose to the glycolysis pathway and generate um, pyruvic acid from it okay next point that is regulating glycolysis is the level of oxygen now this effect was again discovered by pasteur and named after him known as pasteur effect which shows how the availability of oxygen diminishes the effect of glycolysis the most important point is there hypoxia leads to acceleration of glycolysis that means if oxygen is not available in the atmosphere of the cell in the cellular atmosphere then glycolysis rate will increase at least initially okay um so we can say this as pasteur effect remember the name pasteur effect that is hypoxia in case of hypoxic condition rate of glycolysis will increase now let me come to the main point of regulation of glycolysis in the entire process of glycolysis there are actually three steps which are irreversible see step 1 which is catalyzed by hexokinase step 3 which is catalyzed by phosphofructokinase 1 and step 10 which is catalyzed by actually pyruvate kinase so these three steps and these three enzymes are the key enzymes and if we can control or the factors that control these three enzymes are the factors that will control the entire process of glycolysis so the first step is hexokinase as uh, i was saying in the earlier part of my lecture that hexokinase is the main enzyme that is responsible for conversion of glucose to glucose 6 phosphate and is found in most of our cells so this hexokinase amount increases uh, as uh, we need to do the glycolysis okay so it is got very high affinity for glucose and it permits the initiation or the commitment step of glycolysis now what controls this hexokinase the amount of g6p that is glucose 6 phosphate if the amount of g6p is high in your cell at the present moment then it will inhibit the hexokinase that means we won't need more of pyruvic acid okay and the same will happen in case of glucokinase also glucokinase is actually found in case of pancreatic beta cells and in liver cells now what happens the uh, affinity of glucose uh, glucokinase for glucose is much lower as compared to hexokinase so we will require much higher amount of glucose in the blood to for glucokinase to work which happens just after having a carbohydrate meal or in case of hyperglycemia so in both cases if the amount of g6p or glucose 6 phosphate increases then these enzymes are inhibited as a result the entire glycolysis process will be inhibited the next enzyme is phosphofructokinase now this is a very important enzyme because this is the rate limiting enzyme of the entire glycolytic process so this will be controlled by the amount of atp available in our body pfk is actually inhibited by high level of atp low ph and high level of citrate 
okay so these three things uh, uh, that is if you are saying at present is acidic if the amount of citrate available is already high and if amount of atp is high then pfk will be inhibited and as a result entire glycolysis will be inhibited the third enzyme is pyruvate kinase again like pfk high atp and high alanine level that is amino acid alanine high level will uh, inhibit pyruvate kinase and therefore it will also inhibit the entire process of glycolysis but on the other hand fructose 16 pi phosphate will act as an activator of pyruvate kinase that means if f16 pp that is fructose 16 pi phosphate is high in our cell then that will stimulate the pyruvate kinase so these three are the main key enzymes that you will have to keep in mind which control the entire process of glycolysis and the last portion is the hormonal regulation we are all familiar with the hormone names insulin and glucagon and again these hormones are acting at the three key steps that is step 1 step 3 and step 10 and in all these steps insulin is acting as a positive regulator that is it is stimulating the process of glycolysis while glucagon is decreasing that is inhibiting the process of glycolysis so at present if your cell has ha a high glucagon by insulin ratio then um, it is obvious that your glycolysis process will be inhibited okay so with this i come to the end of this lecture in this entire lecture i have tried to uh, discuss about the entire mechanism of glycolysis then i, I have to tell you regarding the um uh, regarding the regulatory process of glycolysis and third of all i have told you about the um significance of glycolysis so let me stop presenting my screen okay so if you have any questions you can ask me the glycolysis is a very important uh, metabolic process that uh, controls the entire aerobic respiration process in our body so it is very important that you remember all the tiny bit of aspects not only the 10 steps that are leading to the production of two molecules of atp and two molecules of nadh but the control points also and of course the hormonal regulation of glycolysis okay so thank you